Welcome to 60 Skills. We will now discuss why evoke Redina. As was mentioned earlier in the introduction, Redina is a near-earth spirit whose purpose is to teach magicians Kabbalah in the tradition of Franz Barden's third book, Key to the True Kabbalah. So evoking Redina serves two purposes. One, it initiates practitioners into a long series of planetary meditations, the complete nature of which will be discussed in a moment. However, the near-earth zone is the first part of this process. Two, it also provides a practitioner a practice partner for working with Barden's Kabbalah. Now, this is very important as this is a fairly rare skill set. At the time of the presentation of these materials, there are maybe three to four hundred people worldwide who are conversant in this technique to the point where they can do it upon command. This does not provide much of a teaching base. However, in planetary magic, there is a solution to this. Contact a spirit who knows Kabbalah. In this case, one of Rodina's prime functions is to initiate magicians into the Kabbalah. I will quote you from Franz Barden's second book, Practical Evocation. Redina, 26 degrees Scorpio. Redina is an authority on the subject of thurgy, i.e. Kabbalah. All thurgic healing methods on this planet are under his jurisdiction. He knows exactly how to cure every, every disease through the Kabbalah. Redina and trust the magician with many Kabbalistic formulae for curing the severest ailments. This may require that the magician record those Kabbalistic formulae in a book of formulas, and they might fill an entire book. Should the magician find it desirable, he will be instructed to such an extent by Redina that he will be able to achieve miraculous cures through the Kabbalah. So additionally, Redina is in charge of Kabbalistic medicine. For the most part, in my personal experience, this involves charging physical med medicines, such as herbs, elixirs, or liquids, with various Kabbalistic formulae. This may also involve the use of holy baths and other materials. I will not reveal any of the formulas Redina has granted me to this point in time in this presentation. If that is something you're interested in, you will need to work with him. Now, a few notes on why you should not work with Redina. First of all, you need to understand that these spirits have an intelligence of their own. And for the most part, they reflect off your internal mirrors. For those of you familiar with Franz Barden's soul mirrors or the black and white mirrors, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you who are not let me give a little bit of an explanation. For the most part, and this is not completely true, but mostly true, spirits reflect off of a practitioner who brings them forth. So if you lead a nice, clean life and you are a good person, that is generally the nature of a spirit that you will encounter. However, if you have made no effort to clean up your personal act, either through repeatedly establishing equilibrium, developing precepts, or doing the work of the black and white mirrors, these entities will reflect off of what they see in you. And what they see in you will determine how they present themselves. The result of which is a spirit that is negatively inclined is usually the result of a spirit reflecting off the negative aspect of a practitioner's personality. This is not exclusively true. Do not get me wrong. There are many entities out there 
that are entirely negative in origin and should never be contacted by anybody for any purpose. That said, if you are going to work with Redina, you need to have made efforts to have cleaned up your personal life. Second, you need to have mastery of your own Akasha. If you do not have mastery of your own Akasha, instead of performing the path of the magician, you will be performing the path of the sorcerer. And this is a game that you will lose. Without access to your own Akasha, when dealing with entities, it inevitably turns into a battle of will. And because these entities do not have physical bodies, and in many cases exist beyond the reach of time and space, the fact of the matter is they can heckle you at their leisure 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You do not want this. You want to be in charge of the process of evoking any spirit, and most importantly, having the ability to send it away. That ability to send it away is highly contingent upon your ability to access Akasha at will. As the simple fact of the matter is, the bodies that the spirits inhabit when they come into this level of existence are very susceptible to Akashic influence. They can literally be torn apart by this. Now this does not kill them, it just banishes them back to wherever they came from, and coming here takes quite a bit of effort. Redina as an entity is not a negative one. However, if you do not have access to your own Akasha, and you have made no effort to mitigate your own personal personality issues, you will end up evoking, sooner or later, a negative manifestation of that entity. And this can make your life quite miserable. In short, don't do this. On the other hand, if your intention is to work with the planetary meditations, a better ally cannot be found than Redina. He has the additional bonus of being able to initiate you into the Kabbalah. Now the way this normally works is you evoke Redina and you have a question in mind. This is very important. When you evoke any spirit for the first time, do not talk to the spirit first. Wait until it addresses you. This is a universal rule with evocation and should never be violated. There are a number of reasons for this, but I want you to keep in mind, never speak to a spirit until it attempts to speak to you first. Once Redina speaks to you, let him know what you want to learn. He will then begin to generate the energy within you. Depending upon how developed your clairvoyance and clairaudience are, you may have a fairly clear conversation, or if only your clairsentience is adequately developed, you'll simply begin to feel the energy move and you can play along with it. This is one of the basic ways in which Redina exists in order to teach you Kabbalah. If you have a more specific question regarding medicine, for example, he can provide you a variety of formula on this. However, again, I will not be revealing any of those here. Just keep in mind that is a subspecialty of his and it is available to you as well. Now, when working with Redina, you will also need a sigil card. You will only need this for your first couple of evocations, and a copy of this will be attached to the coursework if I am able to do so. This is Redina's sigil. You will need to write this down in red ink on a piece of paper. This is what you will be using in the ball above head method when you evoke Redina. After you've practiced this for a while, you will no longer need the sigil card and you will be able to evoke Redina at will. But in the beginning, this is a crucial part of your practice. Let us begin. Welcome to 60 Skills. What are the requirements for evoking Redina? Well, first of all, you have to have all of your internal energies up to the level of Akasha developed. If you have not yet developed your own Akasha, you quite simply have no business engaging in this practice. Second, you will require a sacred space or sacred space in time in which to practice this exercise. Additionally, you will need a sigil card, the sigil of which is included in this course, of Redina with which to bring him into existence. If you choose to work with Redina only at the non-dual light and mental levels, this is about the limit of what you need. If, on the other hand, you wish to evoke him into the astral 
or perform a physical evocation into the here and now, you will also need a triangle and circle, as well as a more established private place in which to conduct this. Incense is very useful for purifying the area as well, and while it is not necessary as this lesson serves as an individual initiation, getting a copy of Franz Barden's second book, Practical Evocation, is highly recommended. Let us begin. Welcome to 60 Skills. We will now discuss the planetary path of development. The planetary path of development is one of three pathways of development contained within the works of Franz Barden and one of the three major pathways of development in Esoterica. You have the internal power model, which is largely represented by Franz Barden's first book. You have the path of the planets, which is represented by Franz Barden's second book, and honestly speaking, the major pathway of development within Western esotericism. It is also a major pathway of development in Asian or Eastern esotericism as well. Finally, you have the rarest of the three, the pathway of using Kabbalah or the ball above head combined with three-point concentration method. This, in turn, leverages fundamental forces within the universe to propel you into an enlightened state and allows for manifestation, depending on how much work you have done as well. All three of these are independent yet interrelated methods of development. To be blunt, if you haven't done most of the work in the first book, Initiation into Hermetics, and developed your own Akasha, you have absolutely no business engaging in the other two. That said, you don't need to engage in the work of the third book, Key to the True Kabbalah, if you wish. You can simply end your development with the planetary works and the first book. But let's get back to what the planetary meditations represent. All right. As we mentioned earlier, Redina is a near-Earth entity. Typically, most of these near-Earth entities, as presented in Barden's second book, Practical Evocation, represent schools and are sometimes referred to as the heads of the earth zone. The energy they work with in particular is that of etheric energy or near astral, near physical energy. This allows these schools to exist outside time. And quite honestly, the realms that inhabit this part of the astral form most of the legends behind Atlantis and many other lost civilizations. These things, such as the White Brotherhood, really only ever existed in their true form on the astral. And by, and by being in the near-Earth zone, these are most easy to access by human beings. Etheric energy is not an energy form that is normally trained directly within Barden's system, but for those of you familiar with the Golden Dawn system or many of these other Western magical systems, you will know that etheric energy is trained quite a great deal within those systems. It is a unique form of energy that has a variety of direct applications to all sentient beings. That said, we will not get into a long discussion regarding this. Just understand that the near Earth zone represents this energy most clearly. Next up, you have the lunar sphere, and this is the first of the classical planetary meditations. The lunar sphere is primarily considered concerned with astral energy and has the effect of greatly expanding a practitioner's astral field, as well as sensitivity to energy writ large. After this, you have Mercury, and Mercury is in charge of mental energy and tends to expand a practitioner's mental energy writ large. Venus, on the other hand, has a squeezing effect upon the subtle bodies that tends to pull latent issues to the surface, and it does so, does so via the mechanism of pleasure. Next, you have the sun, whose purpose is to burn off all of these negativistic energies that are brought up by Venus and increase vital energy writ large within a practitioner by virtue of having cleaned all the junk out of the pipe, so to speak. Following this, you have the planet of Mars. The purpose of Mars is to take this newly liberated energy and to push that energy into the superstructure of a practitioner. This tends to increase sexual energy in men and make people much stronger 
but fundamentally it is concerned with building will for the, further, for the furtherance of your life's goals. Next, you have Jupiter. Jupiter's purpose in all of this is to teach a person how to be a king. Literally, Jupiter moves you into that mode of being in charge of your own kingdom, of having responsibility for people who are dependent upon you, and being a completely independent individual. Energetically, it also has the effect of widening other people's mental fields. Because of this, they tend to become subservient to you and willingly help you with the achievement of your personal goals. I will not be discussing Saturn here. Suffice to say, Saturn deals with karma and is very unpleasant, and there is no reason to pursue development of karma, sorry, of Saturn, unless a practitioner is specifically interested in making it to Uranus for the sake of engaging the Kabbalistic spirits there. So that is a brief segue into the planetary meditations and yet another reason why a practitioner would want to learn how to evoke Redina as an initiator into this system. Let us begin. Welcome to 60 Skills. We will now discuss the issue of sigils. What are sigils? Sigils are essentially the symbol that is associated with a given entity. The use of a sigil is not unlike making a video call to another human being. Now, all of the sigils that you see in common use in the common books for various entities such as the entities of the Lamegaton or the Arbitel are very old. They have been in use a very, very long time, and these sigils tend to be like the secretary at the front door of a major corporation. You're not really talking to the entity directly at that point in time, but you're entering the building, so to speak, to have a conversation. With these older entities in particular, they tend to have very large and very well-developed egregores that bring all kinds of good and bad things with them. That said, in most of those cases, a practitioner will have to go through a series of evocations to finally meet with the entity in question. This can be quite time consuming and potentially expensive depending upon the requirements of a given evocation. The sigil that we are using here for Redina comes from Franz Barden's second book, Practical Evocation. Now, this is important that these were most likely Franz Barden's personal sigils. Now, also keep in mind, once you have successfully evoked an entity on a few occasions, you can then have the entity provide you a personal sigil for your own use. These in general probably shouldn't be shared with the majority of people out there. That said, it will make for much easier contact with that aspect of the entity that you are looking for. So keep in mind, what you get from an entity is highly contingent upon who you are. If you're a medical doctor and you contact a medical entity, you will get a variety of information pursuant to the best modern technology available. If, on the other hand, you have no real medical training, the conversation that you have with that entity will be quite a bit more basic. The simple fact of the matter is you don't have anything to reflect off of when it comes to dealing with that entity. So keep in mind, what you get from these entities is highly correlated with who you are. And this also goes back to our earlier discussion regarding what kind of entity you end up encountering, whether it's its beneficent aspect or maleficent aspect, depending upon what's going on with you. But keep in mind, the sigils that you find in books generally represent the first step in contacting an entity, and you yourself will want to develop sigils for them that are personal to you. Now, these sigils can have a color requirement, but generally ink is sufficient to writing them down. Also keep in mind, you will only need to use a sigil until such a time as you become familiar enough with an entity that you don't need it anymore. Now, this also brings up another issue where you should not leave sigils lying around for the uninitiated. The simple fact of the matter is the very sensitive, regardless of their training level, 
can end up making, at, a ver at the very least, mental level contact with these things. The result of which can be quite destabilizing. So whenever you write your sigils down, put them in a private journal or in a place where others are not apt to read it. The simple fact of the matter is this isn't healthy for most people without a significant amount of training, as we've mentioned repeatedly throughout this coursework. So that's a little talk on sigils and their true nature. Let us begin. Welcome to 60 Skills. We will now discuss how spirits manifest. If you are bringing a spirit into your Akashic field, this is really highly related to mental wondering, in which you would project a picture of the planet involved, project yourself into that planet, and then immerse yourself on that planet's energy. Or in this case, you would be using Radina's personal sigil. So you place the sigil mentally above your head and project your consciousness into it. In many cases, this is very similar to mental wandering, with one notable exception. The second you begin to project your consciousness into one of these realms, be it the near-Earth zone, the lunar zone, or Mercury, etc., etc., the energy of that zone will begin to burn through your mental field. This can be varying degrees of uncomfortable. The near-Earth zone, because we live so close to it all of the time, is really not much of a big deal and simply requires ventilation with a little vital force when finished. The efforts you will need to engage in for using the higher planetary energies, however, are quite a bit more complicated, but we will get to those in the appropriate course. Now, when you bring the spirit down into your mental field, if someone is recording this or watching you, what you will see is something that is sometimes referred to as face dancing. In this case, your face will actually contort into different shapes as that spirit begins to more solidly enter into your various bodies. For the purpose of our exercises today, we will only be working with Redina down to the mental level. Bringing a spirit down into the astral or down into the vital really should only be done for a couple of other purposes. When it's brought down into the vital and control of your own body is handed over to the spirit, this is an act of mediumship, and we will discuss that in more detail later on. However, there are some cases where you would want the spirit to come down into your astral or vital field in order to show you how to deal with certain kinds of Kabbalistic energies in this case. For example, if it needed to show you a given mudra or a given body posture to exhibit, that would be a reason for the spirit to come down to that level. Generally speaking though, since you're looking for information and initiation into Kabbalah, the spirit only should come down to the mental level. And again, this is what we will be dealing with here. Now, if you want to perform an external evocation where you are bringing the spirit into form in front of you, for this you are going to need to utilize the triangle and circle as is commonly utilized in most ritual magic evocation methods. By this, there's a protective circle that the practitioner stands within, and in front of the practitioner there is a triangle that the spirit is manifested into. This provides a couple of things. First of all, the circle and triangle help protect the practitioner. This is important to realize that the physical manifestation of a lot of these things is not terribly friendly or well disposed to human beings. If one of these things breaks containment, it can be quite dangerous. Now, the triangle also exists as a way to focus energy within a tightly confined space. And this is important because if you're bringing an entity into the astral or near physical, you are going to have to construct an energetic body for that entity to inhabit. This is quite expensive in terms of energy. For ritual practitioners, this is one of the reasons why their evocations have to be carefully timed for the most part, involving certain lunar cycles, astrological phenomenon, and they have to build up the magical charge, so to speak, over a very long period of time, because in general, they don't have much internal power of their own. I have known and worked with individuals who could do evocation in the raw, which is where they just used 
purely internal power to construct a body for one of these things. It is an exhausting process and takes many hours, and again, is best performed in a place designed for this. And you will know, if you have traveled to Asia and other places, that there are temples specifically designed for the act of evocation. At a minimum, they have the elemental lords or elemental powers in the four directions. And the reason for this is it provides a kind of physical equilibrium to the place. You then have to fill the place with the energy of the associated spirit planetary-wise. So for a lunar spirit, this would be with lunar energy. Then you have to construct an energetic body using vital, astral, mental, akashic energies to house the spirit in for its existence in this realm of action. When properly done, these things can in fact be evoked to the visible eye. That said, most people without significant training find this extremely disturbing. A better course of action is to conjure or evoke the entity into a crystal ball or something that it can reflect off of. Entities in general do not like this. It appears to be uncomfortable to them on some kind of a level. But if you need to get a very clear explanation from an entity, because perhaps your clear audience is not terribly well developed, this is one way to do that, and it provides a physical barrier between the practitioner and the entity. Now, when engaging in this kind of physical evocation, you need to have access to your own Akasha, and having various banishing implements available is generally a good idea. Herbs like asphateta, having charcoal burning that can be dumped on in the event of an emergency, things of this nature. And if you wish to go down this route, I would strongly advise you explore the works of John Michael Greer, particularly Circles of Power, in which he discusses at length how to go about doing these things in a safe manner. For reasons of both time and personal safety involving anyone who might watch this without proper training, I will not be getting into how to do that in this video. You will need to look elsewhere. That said, Redina as an entity is fairly well disposed to human beings. That said, you should never be capricious with your acts involving any non-physical entity. Because in particular, if you have not cleaned up your personal act, this is something that can reflect off you poorly and create problems of its own. Let us begin. Welcome to 60 Skills. We will now discuss the differences between mediumship and evocation. In evocation, when a practitioner is bringing an entity into their Akashic or mental field, they are doing so from the standpoint of controlling the engagement. The entity is never at any point in charge of the practitioner's body, and a practitioner is certainly not turning their will over to the entity. Instead, what they are having is essentially a conversation. Now, depending upon the strength of a practitioner's clairvoyance or clairaudience, this can be a conversation as open as you and I are having right now. Otherwise, it may simply be a feeling and information may simply enter a practitioner's field. Some entities, on the other hand, are quite shy and will only work with you in terms of visions and things of this nature. It really just depends on what you're working with. Now, let us contrast this with mediumship. Mediumship, in general, is a very bad idea. In mediumship, a practitioner is turning over their body and mind to an entity to express itself. These entities can literally speak through a practitioner, move a practitioner's body around, and generally represents a severe abrogation of a practitioner's free will. Mediums in general also don't tend to live terribly long because the energy of bringing an entity into their body and letting it control them like that is extremely taxing. Certain religious groups have people designated as mediums for communicating directly with spirits within their lineage. Again, in this case, these mediums do not live very long. I tend not to want to think much about what this implies regarding the karma in those religious systems. You will have to make that determination for your own. However, the reason why you want to be in control of your own Akasha is so that when you've gotten the information that you're there to get from a given entity, you can send it home and sever the relationship between you and the entity. 
So keep in mind, this is the difference between a medium on the one hand and a magician engaging in evocation on the other. When it comes to the magician, they are in control of the process and a medium is just along for the ride. I think it is up to you to determine which you would prefer, but I know for a fact what I would prefer. I would prefer to be a magician in that set of circumstances. This is another good reason for not letting entities into your subtle fields any closer than the mental. But that is a discussion for another time. Let us begin.